Ned, in wanting to understand what we're all about, the so-called mind-body problem is the perennial one that philosophers ask through history and indeed still today. Tell me, please, what is the mind-body problem? The mind-body problem is the problem of what is the fundamental nature of the mind. Maybe the best way to see it is by way of an analogy. We can ask about other things what their fundamental nature is. So, for example, we can ask what the fundamental nature of water is. It turns out it's um, a certain structure of hydrogen and oxygen mo uh, molecules, um, which is colloquially known as H2O. So it has a chemical nature. Water has a chemical nature. Some other things have different natures. So, for example, uh, what, is, what makes an adding machine an adding machine? Um, it turns out it's a kind of function. I mean, it doesn't just turn out. It's part of our concept that that's the way it is. So if we ask about the mind, what makes the mind a mind? It turns out there are different aspects of the mind. Some of them are like water. Some of them are like adding. Mm. Consciousness is like water. It has a biological essence. So the mind-body problem for consciousness is one where the question is, what is the biological nature of the mind? The, the mind-body problem for thought and other aspects of cognition turns out probably to be mainly functional. Um, it's a matter of how um, a thought, how representations in the mind function so as to produce thinking. So you see the mind-body problem, in essence, bifurcated into two kinds of problems. That's right. One is a biological problem relating the mind to the body or the brain, as it, we would say today. The other is the function, the cognitive psychology, uh, uh, how it works from a, a cognitive science computational point of view. That's right. So how then can we make progress in each way do they uh, they obviously have to relate to each other but oh, do, we, do, sure, yeah. do, 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 do we do we work each one independently yes i think well we don't work them independently we work them together each endeavor keeping an eye on the other one because as you say you want you know it wouldn't do, you'd be wrong mm -hmm. if you got answers in in uh, those two enterprises that didn't fit mm -hmm. Uh, let's just talk historically for a moment, uh, because we say mind-body problem, uh, mm -hmm. and again, we would say, if we said it today, it would be mind-brain. But w what's the history of the mind-body problem? Just, just, just quickly. Well, in its contemporary form, I think it, it goes back at least as far as Descartes, who thought that the um, uh, the interface between mind and body was in the pineal gland. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he posed, he put the question in the way that uh, appeals to contemporary thinkers um, in terms of how do the mind and body interact. And, and what has been the, the progress in terms of the different ways of thinking about it uh, from Descartes to the current day? Well, I think uh, a key event was the idea in the late 1950s by an Australian philosopher named J.J.C. Smart, who was preceded by a psychologist named uh, U.T. Place, of thinking of the relation between mind and brain in terms of the notion of identity, the idea that consciousness, for example, just is a process in the brain. And Smart and Place were very influenced by... Um, the, uh, the, the, the scientific discoveries of the nature of heat in terms of molecular kinetic energy, the scientific discovery of the nature of um, um, uh, fire in terms of oxidation. So those discoveries in which uh, science discovers that um, some phenomena described at, a, at an upper level, like heat, water, fire, lightning, just is some phenomenon describable at a lower, more molecular level. And when you say just is, this is the identity, means it's exactly it's the, the same. It's the same is as the is <laughs> in 2 plus 2 is 4. Mm. So the idea is this is, if you, and the modern or the, the, the contemporary version of the mind-body problem is what is the fundamental nature of mind? Where you re, what you're really asking is what is it? In this same sense as you can ask what, what is water? It turns out it's H2O. And so if you would say the mind is the brain in the yeah. same sense that water is H2O, mm -hmm. H2O, you have a com arguably a complete answer to the question, and it's a full stop. Yeah. That's, that's identity. Yeah. The thing about identity is sometimes you, you need further explication to, to tell you how an identity could be true. Mm -hmm. So just to say that a 
phenomenal property, like the property of what it is like to see something red, is a certain brain property. We're, even if it's true, we're not going to be satisfied with that because we want to know how a mental property could be a brain property. Well, yeah, but that, that is the, what happened to the identity. Uh, that's not commonly accepted today uh, because, yes. because of, uh, of, of the impossibility, or some would say the difficulty, some impossibility, of making the identity stick. Yes. You, you try to make it stick, but, but uh -huh. things squiggled out from it. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> so so what, what happened to, the, to the, the postulation of identity, that the mind is equal to the brain? Well, I think people are having trouble understanding how that could be true, even if it is true. Um, the problem is the, you know, the, the, the problem of the explanatory gap, the problem of um, how it could be that the neural basis of a given phenomenal state is the neural basis of that state as opposed to some other state or n some other phenomenal state or none at all. We don't understand that. And furthermore, we don't even see how we could understand it. And that is the, um, uh, the, what causes the difficulty. What, what you're saying is not only don't we understand it, but we don't even see what could count as an explanation of that. That's, that's right. Because what is the that? The that is a very large sequence of of neuronal spikes of electricity and in in hundreds of billions yeah. of, of nerve cells and and maybe trillions of different connections and chemicals passing back and forth yeah that's what it is right and, and so we don't see how what could count as explanation how any of that could be this phenomenal feeling of seeing red Right. A good way to think about this was, is a way that first proposed by my colleague at NYU, Tom Nagel, where he said, we're like a pre-Socratic philosopher who's told that matter is energy. He can't understand it because he doesn't have an adequate concept of matter and an adequate concept of energy that would allow him to see how those two concepts could pick out the same phenomenon in the world. Mm. Similarly, we don't have an adequate phenomenal concept, that is a mentalistic concept, an adequate scientific concept, to see how those uh, concepts could pick out the same thing. You know, as Nagel said, um, even if we were told what, the, uh, uh, what consciousness is in the brain, we wouldn't really understand it. So I think the, the key things that need to be done are um, we need to work on the concepts of consciousness. And you know, I think at least we have to separate phenomenal consciousness from certain other kinds of consciousness. And of course, we have to work on the neuroscience of it um, so that we can find concepts such that we can understand how they pick out the same thing. Some would say that the vast majority of the work really should be done on the neuroscience side because there isn't a whole lot of stuff on the, on the phenomenal side uh, in reality. But, but once we understand the neural side, the phenomenal side will, will uh, fall out of it. It will be a natural consequence. So we don't have to worry really about this side. We do have to worry terribly about the neuroscience side because that will be a natural consequence. We don't need to know that up front or a priori. Um, I have some sympathy with that, but I also think that we need to make some distinctions on the mental side, and then we need to pay careful attention to the science to see what further distinctions need to be made. I think if the study of consciousness uh, goes in the direction that the study of almost every other phenomenon has gone in, we will need to do some revision of our ordinary concepts to, so, so that we can produce mentalistic concepts that match up with the scientific concepts in the right way. Some philosophers would say that uh, consciousness, though, is fundamentally different than virtually anything else in science, and that we will uh, make lots of progress on the so-called easy problem, uh, but in, in the fundamental phenomenology problem of the, of the hard problem, that it's, it's almost uh, uh, impossible to ultimately uh, uh, solve that. Look, I think we shouldn't um, um, conflate our current lack of understanding with a principled problem. A hundred years ago, people could not understand how life could be something biological. But they did come to understand that, and I, I'm optimistic. I think that in the end, we will understand what, what consciousness is from a biological point of view.